Hi there, I'm Claire Williams from the British Equestrian Trade Association. Welcome to today's episode, which is all about rider safety. This forms part of BETA's Summer of Safety. It's our opportunity to highlight safety of all aspects for horses and riders, from body protectors and hats, through tack safety, biosecurity, yard safety and equine health. This fortnight, we're focusing on riding out and riding safety. And today we're looking at the work of the Air Ambulance Service. It's one of those essential rider services that I think many of us as riders simply take for granted. And joining me today to talk about the fantastic support they give is Dr. Richard Fawcett. Richard is a consultant in emergency medicine at uh, the major trauma centre, which is the Royal Stoke University Hospital. He's been flying with the Midlands Air Ambulance Charity now since the beginning of 2012, and he's going to talk to us today about the work of the Air Ambulance Service and the key aspects of that. Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Um, jumping in in place of Jim, really appreciate it. Oh, that's okay. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for uh, inviting me on to, to talk to you and highlight some of the, uh, the the ways that we as an air ambulance and us as a charity can can kind of work with you as an equestrian um, association as well as helping other riders, etc. And I think charity is the key. I think I didn't realise that you weren't funded through the NHS or do you get any government funding? So, yeah, unfortunately, I think this is one of the misconceptions that the general public uh, kind of hold. They, they, you know, the the air ambulances throughout the country, you know, there's various charities. They, you know, they, there's so many TV programs and, and so many kind of great kind of teams out there that when people have a serious accident or a ser serious illness and they see the helicopter above coming to, to offer some real life-saving care, they just expect it's funded by the NHS. And, and that's not the case at all. These All the air ambulance is within the UK and stuff are all charity funded, uh, well, within England anyway. Um, and, and I think that's that's a really important kind of message to, to try and highlight to the general public. But, you know, if you want to see these amazing teams coming in and offering some real life-saving treatment to, to patients at the roadside or, or in the field, uh, for example, for, for your riders, then, then it's really important that they're aware that these are they're purely charity run. They're, there's no government funding whatsoever. Um, and it's just through the the amazing kind of uh, charity work that, that fundraisers do and the donations that the general public give and uh, uh, etc. That, that really enables us and, and the other kind of air ambulances in, in, in England to, to carry on doing the great work that they do. And I think that, that that is absolutely so key, and especially as riders, we do tend to ride off-road, and that's why the air ambulance and the helicopter service is the ones that are going to reach us we're in the middle, when we're in the middle of a field somewhere. How, how much does it cost every time you do one of those flights? Mm. What is it in real terms? How much does it actually cost you as a charity to do that? So... If, if we mobilize the air ambulance, if we mobilize one of the three kind of aircraft that we uh, that we run out of the Midlands Air Ambulance Charity, uh, it's about two and a half thousand pounds per flight. So per, per mission that we do. We also run a, a critical care service. So we have uh, some enhanced care paramedics known as critical care paramedics. Uh, in, that, in some regions, they call advanced paramedics. And basically, they, they go out on like a rapid response car and they can offer a very similar service as well. But obviously, going by road as opposed to air. Again, all funded by the charity. And again, you're looking at about £225 just to launch launch the vehicle as opposed to the aircraft. So, so you know, you think about the number of calls or a number of missions that, that the charity is going on per day. And it doesn't take long before you start racking up quite serious amounts of cash. And and our horse riders, do you do you have to attend horse riders? Quite yeah, so, so like like any sort of member of the public who enjoys doing recreational kind of sport, you know, who's going to go out and and do something that involves any element of risk? You know, uh, horse riders uh, are one of those groups that we go to, and we probably go to a horse ride, I'd say, on average about once a week. You know, obviously, certain times of the year we go to a lot more, and then other times it's slightly less. But I think looking at our stats is about one, one, one per week. And, um, you know, and in total, we kind of do about four and a half thousand missions a year as, as from, from the Midlands. Air. I mean, that's just our charity. That's so just we, you. We that's just the Midlands. Midlands. That's, yeah. So that's just the Midlands Air Ambulance Charity. Obviously, you multiply that up by all the other regional kind of uh, air ambulances throughout the UK. And you start to see, you know, it's quite a big kind of undertaking that, that, 
that they're doing from a pre-hospital point of view and supporting those people who have accidents as well and taking their, their kind of recreational hobbies. And and you would be we would be directed to you via just calling nine nine nine. So when you get to the scene, well, is that how you're activated? Yeah. So so like like most emergency services, when when you kind of ring nine nine nine, you're you're directed to that kind of regional ambulance. Uh, area. So if you're within within the Midlands, you'd get directed to a Midlands call take taker who then, you know, records, records what you're saying. And as soon as you start highlighting that, you know, potentially this is a, you know, severe trauma case because, you know, you've been thrown off your horse and, and you're severely injured. Then what happens is the call taker flags it up to what's known as the regional trauma desk. So what mm -hmm. we have is we have a critical care paramedic who also flies on the air ambulance with us on, on the helicopters. Part of their work is sitting within the within the control centre for the ambulance service, screening and uh, uh, highlighting key jobs where we're going to make a real difference. So when when for example a horse rider is you know out on a hack or something and then they they fall off and they get injured, when whoever's with them or if they're able to make the call themselves starts you know, highlighting to this, then then they get put through to, you know, or, or a specialist paramedic can then ring them back and get further details, you know, highlighting the real kind of need to, to send out a specialist team to offer enhanced care above and beyond what, what a sort of a normal land roadside paramedic can, can, can offer the patient if, if that's what's required. And how fast does it happen? How fast do you actually get in the year if that's what's required? So, so there's 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 a couple of ways that happens. So sometimes what happens is, I mean, if and the, so the importance of having the the uh, critical care paramedic on the desk is they can interrogate the call and and put some clinical info in there that your normal call handler can't do, and by doing that they can identify like an immediate dispatch. So obviously, if if they're able to identify that you know this is a severe trauma case that you know this is this requires the aircraft, they can do an immediate dispatch and and that basically sends the job straight through to us uh, as an enhanced care team who are basically sat sort of at a moment's notice to move out on the airbase by the helicopter, just basically poised, ready to go, um, you know, as soon as we get the job. So if, if that's the case, you know, if I'm on duty, I'll be sat there with the pilot and the paramedic. Uh, job comes through to our radio and straight away, we'll kind of run out to the aircraft. And then the pilot, as soon as the pilot's done his ground checks, as in, you know, starting up the engines and stuff, then we'll lift off. So the idea is you should be in the air within about sort of three to four minutes. Wow. Uh, and then basically flying at about 120 miles an hour as the crow flies directly to, to scene. So you're not having to negotiate traffic or, you know, long windy roads or anything that normally delays a normal road ambulance yeah. from getting there. And, and that's one of the key things that the aircraft does is it really kind of reduces that time to scene um, uh, mm -hmm. transfer uh, as well as bringing an enhanced care team, which is, you know, a doctor-led service with an enhanced care paramedic with the ability that, you know, we bring out a load of extra kit that's not carried by normal land ambulance, such as blood, you know, ventilators, ability to do in field, like in, in situ kind of mm -hmm. surgical procedures, uh, you know, uh, administer an anesthetic, uh, all, all these things that, you know, are aimed at enhancing the care provided the roadside and, and improving the prognosis for the, for the patient that's in front of you. Wow. And if if you arrive, if you're out and you find somebody that's obviously yeah. had an accident, what yeah. are the key things that you should do if you find somebody that's obviously in need of medical assistance? So I guess, I guess it's just going back to basics because for most people, if they're out and about, you know, they're not carrying the contents of an ambulance in their back pocket, nor are they potentially trained in, you know, advanced kind of, uh, medical kind of aid, etc. I mean, but doing the basics well and doing the and doing some simple things can make a real difference to the prognosis of that patient. I guess the first thing you need to do is assess to see whether the patient's breathing or showing any signs of life. Uh, obviously, if someone's had a serious accident, then it quite it's quite possible that you know if they have suffered a cardiac arrest or, or or they're in such a state where they're not breathing, that initially a identifying that and passing that information on to the to the ambulance service so they can prioritize the cause that you know as a cat one is the immediate dispatch and, and as a top priority for the region to get you some uh, an ambulance to assist you to then start rendering some advanced life support uh, you know that's really important so i guess make an initial assessment are they breathing you know are they showing signs of life if not you know try and have at least some basic first aid knowledge so you can administer some cpr even if it's just 
you know, you don't need to worry about giving breaths and all this sort of stuff, especially in the time of COVID at the moment. But if you're just able to administer some good CPR at the roadside, as soon as you identify it, then that while you're waiting for the ambulance to arrive can make a real difference to the patient's mm -hmm. outcome, you know, just simple stuff like that. Obviously, you know, hoping that they have not suffered a cardiac arrest and actually they're just injured or they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, uh, uh, you know, like the normal patient you go to, not in such extremes, then it's kind of just doing a, a basic kind of assessment. So, you know, are they awake? You know, are they talking to you? And if they're talking to you and they're talking to you in full sentences, you know, hopefully you can gather some normal information from that. So if they're able to talk to you, they're probably maintaining their airway. They're probably breathing normally. Um, and, you know, if they can count to 10 in one breath, then it's unlikely they've got too much going on with their, their respiratory system. It also probably means that they've got a good circulating volume as in, you know, they're, they're able to perfuse their brain with, with, with their blood pressure and stuff. And so there's quite a lot you can gather straight away mm -hmm. from just sitting there and talking to the patient, you know, if they're conscious and stuff. And, and that's quite key as well, because if the patient's talking to you and stuff, you can probably take a slight sigh of relief that they're, they're not in intimate danger just at this point mm -hmm. from, from suffering some sort of major complication. I guess a lot of the stuff with the mechanisms for, how riders fall off is one of the big things you need to worry about is spinal injuries. Now, whether that's breaking your neck or your back or, or potentially your pelvis. So, so a lot of, a lot of riders we find they either have spinal injuries or they, they have quite severe fractures of, you know, breaks of the long bones of their arms or legs. So for these types of patients, you know, if they, if they're awake and talking to you, I guess is, is to, is to find out, you know, what hurts. So, you know, as part of your assessment, when you're chatting to them, say, you know, is your neck sore, you know, and if they start telling you, oh, the middle of my back's really sore, or my neck is really sore, or I've got any tingly, like pins and needles feelings, or I, I can't feel my legs, or, you know, I, I can't seem to move very much, then, then it's important that, you know, if they have sustained a spinal injury, well, that, that, that kind of initial insults already happened. So there's nothing you can do about that. But what you can do is prevent any secondary injuries. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's really important to reassure the patient, stay with them, you know, say, okay, it's all right. Just let's just lie nice and flat, you know, even provide some inline stabilization. So, you know, hold their head, uh, try not to allow them to wriggle around and stuff like that. And just try and keep their spine as straight as possible, kind of by having them, you know, even if they're just like lying there on the ground, um, you know, in a nice kind of straight line. So, you know, you try and prevent any secondary damage or, or worsening the injury that they've sustained when they've, when they've fallen off their horse, for example. Um, other things like simple things as well as, you know, a lot of the time, you know, they're falling off on mud or grass or something and the ground's normally wet. So, you know, they can they can get quite cold quite quickly. So any sort of like uh, warming sort of stuff that you've got, coats, mm -hmm. blankets, anything like that to just try and keep the patient warm and stop them cooling down. Uh, it will, will not only make the patient feel more comfortable, but actually it's got a real kind of physiological advantage uh, to do with the clotting cascade and you know, if they're bleeding from anywhere, it helps it from, well, it, it slows down the, the ability for it to get worse quite drastically and stuff like that. Yeah. So cold, cold is not our friend. So we like to keep our patients nice and warm. Um, and then just simply trying to trying to do a little kind of top to toe of, you know, if, if a leg's really angulated out or anything like that, it's just kind of identifying that. So when, when you make a call to the ambulance service uh, to raise some help, that you can try and give a vague idea of, you know, what's wrong with the patient, how sick they are. So, you know, first of all, you know, is this a cardiac arrest? You know, second of all, are they unconscious? Or, or third of all, well, okay, they're, they're talking and breathing to me, but, uh, you know, they've got uh, a leg that's facing the wrong way and stuff like that, you know. It's, it's just to, to help the ambulance service kind of divert the right resources to you as early as possible so uh, so you know you can you can get the right kind of aid at the right time etc and, um, so. and if somebody's no if somebody's calling you how on earth do you find them so obviously there's various ways so uh if you fall off in your, in your yard in your stables well great you just give your house address if if you're out on a long ride and you're just in the middle of nowhere then you can use that long latitudes and longitudinal stuff which you can't find on os maps or or sometimes your phone will give it to you but fortunately in the last couple of years there's been an app developed called what three words now this is something the ambulance service are using more and more and by just uh by using the app 
it will give you three three words, three random words. But basically, every meter square within on on the planet is based, or every ten meter square within on the planet has three words associated with it. So you can basically narrow down a patient's location within a ten meter uh, area by just giving these three words, and then you retype it back in, and and then the ambulance can pinpoint your your exact location. So so if you as opposed to being in a wood and looking around going, well, all I can see is trees. And I know I'm in the Midlands somewhere and it's kind of quite a big search area. Um, you can go, well, I, I'm within 10 meters of this exact point. And, and that can make a real difference to, mm. to getting people to, to your exact location within, within a timely manner that, that A, you know, if it's anything life-threatening, you know, can, can really kind of speed up the process of getting you to a major trauma center. Or B, if you just, you know, in pain and suffering and don't want to be lying on the ground for a long period of time it's just it just gets you help that bit quicker etc it is an astounding app i've got it myself and it, it's incredible to think that somebody's done that and that it's yeah. so accurate so so we've got hold of you we've told you how the patient is if you know a helicopter's on its way to you is there anything that you can do before the helicopter gets there to make certain that you can land safely so i i guess it all depends on where you are. So if you're in the middle of the woods, then uh, a helicopter requires the, a minimum kind of clear area in order to land. But normally mm. that's twice the diameter of, of, the, of the kind of length of the helicopter. So you're looking at maybe a 30 meter clearing at least that they need to land in. So if you're in a densely wooded area, then they're not going to land at your location. They're going to have to find a field that's close by or clearing and then kind of go into there and then walk to your location. Mm -hmm. So part of it is about um, if if you kind of know the area and you can, you know, there's one field in like the whole area where they're going to land and stuff, you can send someone there to meet them so that they can kind of point the direction of where you are, especially if it's not visible from the sky. By having... But, you know, if, if you're visible from the sky, so say you're in a field, you're doing jumps, et cetera, and you come off, then it's about, you know, being able to signal from the ground to the aircraft. Because sometimes we'll go out and there's several kind of yards with kind of horses and, and jumps and stuff. And when you're flying around, there's just a load of random people on the ground. It's not quite clear sometimes yeah. who's had the actual accident or who's made the call. So maybe having some high vis, you know, uh, like a jacket, something like that. So when you see us overhead, start waving, you know, make it really obvious that you're the people who've made the call because sometimes people will be on the phone and because they're caught talking to the call taker, they think we know exactly which address it is or because they've given a house number, but obviously houses don't have their, their numbers sort of printed on the roofs, et cetera. And, and sometimes it can mean that we're just circling, circling, trying to sort of pinpoint the exact location. Whereas if, someone's on the ground waving frantically then that really helps us just pinpoint the exact location and saves us landing in like the wrong yard somewhere and just kind of increasing that time it takes to get you um and and then and then just kind of keeping updates so as well sometimes if if you're not obviously visible from from the sky it's about our oh, we can hear the aircraft you know when you're on the call to the call taker it sounds like they're overhead now sort of thing and that and that again can just help us a little bit know we're in the right area so then we can just find a, a field close by where we can land and then we can kind of reassess it once we're on the ground and work out a route to, to come and find you if you're slightly less accessible mm. i think it's useful for people to know how much space you need because they may think their field's big enough they may also have other objects on it so they need to clear the objects away to make it as safe for you as possible definitely so things like you know just tethering up your horses and stuff if they're free free running in a field or something because you know the, the aircraft does have a lot of downwash so you know it displaces a lot of air when we're landing uh, due to the lift etc from the blades but also it is a noisy uh aircraft you know it does mm. answer to you know to cattle to to horses etc you know it can be very startling and and that in itself can you know potentially cause a further incident somewhere else because you've got stampeding animals that they've been scared by the aircraft and a lot of the time we might kind of not land in a you know what might be a better location obviously because we don't want to disturb the wildlife well the 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 you know other horses or something like that which could then cause cause further incidences so i mean if there's time you know obviously or if it's at an event for example we go to to some events sometimes it's just you know if, if the patient's sick you know stop the event bring everyone in you know make it a controlled environment so when we're landing we're not going to spook other horses who are going to throw their riders and then give us more patients to deal with 
Yeah, the last thing you need. How many of you actually travel on the aircraft? So I know you've got the pilot yourself and a paramedic. Is is so, that really so? Yeah, most 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 of the time it's a three person crew, um, especially um, with our main aircraft that flies out of RAF Gosford. Uh, we have a, a larger aircraft there that that can carry extra personnel. So sometimes we'll take a, a FEM trainee out with us. So FEM is a pre hospital emergency medicine. Uh, so they're like a senior registrar, so coming up to be a consultant in the next few years, and they they do like a two year training program where it, it kind of gives them like the expertise and stuff mm -hmm. to to work as an independent practitioner and stuff. And so sometimes you might find there's two doctors, or, or sometimes if we're bringing on a new paramedic, two paramedics uh, alongside the pilot and stuff. But your 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 standard team is a team of three: uh, a doctor, a paramedic, and the pilot, whose sole responsibility is basically of the aircraft. Um, you know, that allows us as clinicians to, to just purely focus on the welfare of the patient and not have to really worry too much about the, the other kind of non-medical stuff that's going on. Yeah, really, really important. And so how do people, I mean, I think it's fantastic and something that a lot of people just expect you to turn up when they have an accident without really understanding everything that goes into it. How can people support you? And in supporting the national body, do you get some of that funds or if they want to support their local body, should they really be supporting the mid? in your case, the Midlands Air Ambulance? In my case, Yorkshire Air Ambulance. Yeah, and, and that's it. And basically the best way is if you live in an area, I'd probably advise you to, to, to support your local air ambulance because more likely than not, if you're in your area and you have an accident, they're the people that are going to be responding to you. Um, so, for example, you know, most most air ambulances you'll see, or almost like most charities, there'll be collection boxes around, so in your pubs, shops, etc. Uh, so you can just make, you know, donations on the spot if you want, if you see one of the charity boxes. Another way is, uh, you know, the Midlands, we air ambulance, we have, uh, you know, like, like other charities do, we have a, a charity shop that you can go and visit and obviously... Uh, pay pay for pay for stuff there. Yeah. Um, uh, there's 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 events, you know, gala dinner, everything from gala mm -hmm. dinners to 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 you know um, sponsored sports events, etc. Where where you can make donations, and then the most simplest, I think, where anyone in the Midlands can can you know literally pick up their phone uh, and make a donation at any time is just by texting in support. So we have a uh, uh, like a charitable donation text service where basically if you just text mission impossible uh, mission possible so m-i-s-s-i-o-n-p-o-s-s-i-b-l-e so that's one word um and how much you want to donate so you know for example five pounds and you just text it to the number seven zero zero eight five and you know, i've like, got that on the screen for you as well yeah. so that and it's mid midlandsairambulance.com because you have your own website as well yeah yeah so if people want to find out more about, you know, setting up a direct debit or making regular donations or, you know, getting involved and doing a charity event, you know, if I mean, we, we produce our own charity magazine every month and it's just full of people doing amazing things. Mm -hmm. Everything from like sponsored walks to, you know, golf events to, to, to whatever you can think of, bake-offs. Um, and, and raising money for the charity that way. And, and uh, you know, a lot of their stories get featured in this magazine. And it's really it's really amazing to see what the general public get up to in, in order to raise funds for the charity and carry on supporting the great work that, that everyone does. Yeah, and I think it is invaluable. It makes us feel safer going out riding to know that you're in the background if we need you. And I know I, I had a case locally where um, a lady came off, she was riding and leading, and one of them reacted, kicked out, and she ended up with two broken arms. So, and you know, and you were called out the Yorkshire version yeah. to, to pick her up. So it is absolutely key. Um, and actually, there is an air ambulance uh, week. We've supported it in the past, um, and that's going to be running from the 6th to the 12th of September, um, where if you're listening or watching this from your own area, you can um, you can support that either nationally, um, and that's the, the Air Ambulance UK, which is like your overarching support body, um, and that's really your chance to, to highlight the work in that week of the, the sort of into September, and is actually the last week of our summer of safety as well, so it, it's a good way to round the week off. 
Um, Richard, thank you so much for joining us at, at, at very short notice. Really appreciate it. I think we've all learned a lot and probably learned to appreciate more what you do um, and all equally can continue to offer you support so that you can continue what I view as one of our essential services for riders. So thank you very much indeed. No, thank you, Claire. And like I say, without the amazing support we get from the general public, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So, you know, it's a two-way thing. I mean, I'm always grateful for, you know, there's so many amazing people out there who do such amazing things. And, it, you know, like I say, it just enables me to do the job that I love. And, you know, I hope I never have to meet any of you like on a job. But uh, like I say, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, a great, uh, it's a great service. And I'm really proud of everyone that I work with. You know, they do an amazing thing. Yeah, well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much.